TFL EV is brought to you by Flow Charger, maker of reliable, high-quality charging stations for your electric vehicle. Hey everybody, we've got a great video for you today because this is the cheapest new electric car you can buy and we've owned this car for the past four months and the past 5,000 miles. And in this video, we're telling you what we've learned about this car. We're talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly about the cheapest new EV you can buy. Yeah, but before we tell you what we love and hate after living with it, let me tell you three important things that you have to know about this car. Number three, this is the cheapest electric car you can buy in America. And if you qualify, you can have it for about $17,000. And we'll tell you about that a little bit later. Number two, it gets about 250 miles of all electric range. And number three, it won't catch fire. <laughs> well, this is the second generation. Yep, this one has its new battery already in place. Uh, now this Bolt we purchased for the mid $26,000 region. The starting price now has gone up a little bit to over $27,000, but it does apply for the full $7,500 tax credit. And depending on your state you live in, you can get a couple thousand dollars back as well. So because of reliability, this car is significantly cheaper when you really consider all the expenses um, than the MSRP. Now when this car first came out, I went and drove it and I kind of thought it was a little bit on the, well, it was hit with the ugly stick. Let's put it that way. It was too tall, too narrow. But now that they've updated it, I've actually kind of uh, grown to like it, Tommy. Maybe because we spent real money on it. It's a pretty attractive little car. I think it's got some kind of fun angles and some cool creases here on the headlight design. This car also has a cousin, the Bolt EUV, which is the crossover version. But that's going to be a little bit more expensive and we wanted the cheapest. So to get the most affordable version, you got to get the standard Chevrolet Bolt. Now there's a couple different trims. There's the 1LT and the 2LT. This one is the entry level 1LT. It's also known as the base model. Now this one here is this pretty cool silver. It's got a little bit of like blueness to the silver at certain angles. It comes across as like a light blue, but it's a really good paint color. And um, yeah, you know, it's not an unattractive little car. Yeah, you get a lot actually with the 1LT. So you don't feel like you're being uh, shortchanged, right? In terms of, we'll talk about that in terms of kind of the features. Uh, so let's talk about its biggest downfall, which has to do with charging. So. I want to talk about that later. All right, talk yep. about it later. All We're right. talking about the good things first. Right, talk about the good things. Okay, so another great thing about this car is its compact size uh, means that it's easy to park, easy to maneuver in big cities, but it still has a lot of room in the back seat, in the front seat. Let me move my tissues because we're entering allergy season. But even at six feet tall with my driving position, I have pretty good knee room and I also have excellent headroom. So if you have a small family, if you've got kids you gotta haul around, maybe a couple dogs as I do, this is a super useful car and it holds a ton of stuff. And let me show you something. Unlike the twice as expensive Ionic 5, GM kindly <laughs> gives you a rear windshield wiper, which is useful. Yeah, I use it all the time. Uh, now, popping the trunk here, you can see that I have it in dog mode. So I got my little dog blankie here, and I often fold down the seats like this. One thing I'm not a big fan of is this rear floor, which I have in the most down position, because if you have it in the upmost position, Blaze tends to kind of fall in and get his feet stuck. So I like to keep it down. And another downside is this cloth interior really captures every little bit of animal fur that you get in there. So I'm constantly lint rolling the inside. But look at all the space you got back there. It's a really usable area. Yeah, now one of the odd features of this car, uh, and that has to do with government regulations, is that you would think that this would be the turn signal, but it's not. Yeah, the brake lights and the turn signals are actually down here on the rear bumper, so these just illuminate at night as kind of tail lamps. And then another odd feature... And, and what, What's the reason for that, Tommy? Well, you can't have um, turn signals or brake lights on a movable panel. Um, Another odd feature, which a lot of Bolt owners have addressed in the past, but the little shark fin here. So if you're you know, leaning over on the side, make sure you don't bonk your head on that point. That's uh, something to be careful of. Now this is a front wheel drive car. Um, and uh, unlike many electric cars, well, let me show you, it does not have a front. No, so that is one downside. You know, I've never felt like I've needed one. You know, we have that Model 3. We've, we've owned several Teslas in the past. And I always oh, I forget. Guess. I hate that. I know. That's my pet peeve. I always forget that the front trunk exists. So to be honest, this is one of like three times I've ever looked underneath the hood. And underneath the hood, there isn't a lot to look at except for what looks like very dangerous high voltage wires. And of course, this is where you fill up your windshield wiper fluid. This is pretty cool. So a lot of the powertrain components you can see yep. made in Korea. But uh, they just revamped the tax credit program. A lot of vehicles have lost the ability to qualify for the full credit due to their um, battery sourcing, mineral sourcing. But the Chevrolet Bolt still qualifies. It's made in Michigan. Now, unlike uh, like many electric cars, it doesn't really have a grill, right? 
uh, which is a sure way of telling you that it is an electric car. It also has the black Chevy logo, which I like. It also has sequential turn signals, which I think look really nice. They should do this I, little. Should, should I turn them on? Uh, you're going to have to start the car. Power it up, okay. You're not powered up, you control them. Yeah, I think it's a really cool little touch. So even though you're paying bargain basement prices for the Bolt compared to most new EVs. I like the wipers too. Look at that. I like how you went for the turn signal and turned on the wiper, but no, no, use no, that as a... Do that, Tom. Oh, that I'm sure you meant purpose. to do that. Yeah, I'm sure that's what yeah, that here was. Here are the turn signals. Yeah, so look at that. Very cool, the way it kind of extends out toward the edges. And the lights are really good too, so projector beam headlights, and they work super well. At night, you get a good wide, uh, wide cast of the headlights. It looks really, really good. All right, should we take it for a spin? Yeah, why don't you drive? You've been driving, you've put on most of these 5,000 miles. I'll get in the passenger uh, seat. Now, one of the things that I love about electric cars, of course, is how quiet they are. Uh, and this one is no exception, dude. It sure is. Yeah. So the seats in the first-gen Bolt, the preface of Bolt, were one of the biggest complaints that people had. Um, the new seats are much better. They're still not excellent. I could still use some lumbar support on um, both the driver and the passenger side but they're way better than the first gen bolts. And what's really nice about this, and Chevrolet is really doing this quite well across all their new products, is the huge screen sizes. So both the cluster and the actual main infotainment screen are very sizable. When you consider that we paid under 27K for this car, the, uh, the quality of the screen here is great. We also get um, wireless Apple CarPlay, wireless Android Auto, all standard, which is really nice. Uh, super great screen, very easy to use and one of the highlights of the interior. And it actually gives you quite a bit of information, except for one critical bit of information which it doesn't give you, but let's talk about what it does give you. So we do have these um, EV pages. Let's go to the energy page here, so you can see your flow, whether you're regening or taking power out of the battery. You also have these detail pages, which I use a lot. You can see where the kilowatt hours are going. You can see the driving accessories climate. We also have impact, so this tells you how many miles you've added or subtract based on your technique, terrain, climate. And then you also have the history here, so you can see the miles per kilowatt hour over five mile increments, which is really nice. The one thing it's missing is there's no way, at least in these screens, to tell the exact battery percentage. Well, you could kind of guess at it here. Well, you get these little bars, and each yeah. bar is 5%, and then you kind of have to count them up. But when you're driving at 70, the last thing I want to be doing is counting bars. Same thing here in the center. You can kind of count the bars. Now, on the app, funny enough, you can find the percentage, and then some people boot up the app through CarPlay to figure that out. But I wish they just incorporated it into one of the two screens. Now, one of the numbers that is cool and is very high is at uh, 3.8 miles per kilowatt hour. Uh, that's how efficient this car is, and because it's very... Uh, small and light-ish and, you know, thin-tired, it actually gets really good um, number for that. The higher the number, the better, obviously. Yes, it's very impacted by the temperature. Is it? Tell me about very that. Very impacted. So on a nice, warm Colorado day, when I'm driving up to Fort Collins to see my girlfriend, I can average well over four miles per kilowatt hour on mixed highway city driving. When it gets cold, and unfortunately it's been cold for the vast majority of our ownership of this car since January, um, it dives down right about 3.4. So you can see the lifetime average is 3.5 since we purchased the car. And, um, you know, that's kind of to be expected. There's no heat pump in this car, and it's pretty impacted by weather. That is one thing that is not so great. But uh, still, even 3.4 with a lot of highway driving is pretty good. Now, I do like the fact that you have real buttons for the HVAC, but I hate the fact that for some reason, every time I get in this car, the fan blows way too far and way <laughs> too fast and way too hard. Well, what I'm noticing a lot is it feels like Chevrolet is being very conservative with how much power they put to the inductive heater. So on a cold day when you put auto on, you have to jack up the auto temperature much higher than you'd expect for it to actually start delivering warm air because it tends to just blow Luke warm air really, really fast at you. If you jack up the heat high enough, it will actually blow that warm air, but you do have to play with that a little bit. It is nice so that you have a single zone automatic climate control even in the entry level trim. I was saying for a 1LT, it's relatively well appointed. So you do have one pedal driving, which is, which is right here. You do have a sport mode, uh huh, and you do have this kind of lane keep. Um, what you don't have, obviously, is uh, Super Cruise, uh, a leather steering wheel, but you do have cruise control, uh, and you do have this button, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah, so I think from a, a connectivity standpoint, it's excellent with the CarPlay integration. The radio is pretty good. I like the dual screens. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really nice features on the entry-level trim. We don't have the premium seating surface. We don't have adaptive cruise. We don't have lane centering. We do have uh, we do have one package on this car, which gives us cross-traffic alert on the rear, which is cool, that kind of thing. So if that's not lane centering, what does that one do? It's just lane 
lane departure warning, okay. essentially. Now, the great thing about this car is it still has, like you said, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. GM just announced that as of 2024, all their EVs are going to lose that feature. And that's one of my favorite features. So it's a little bit of a head scratcher as to why GM would get rid of something that so many of us just, you know, feel like we can't live without. Now, one thing, and I didn't clean it on purpose, is all the piano black does a really good job of attracting dust and, um, and little dust bunnies. So that's one of the things that's really is a shame about the interior design. It's also a lot of black plastic, but we're talking about a 259 mile vehicle, EPA rated with over 60 kilowatt hours in the battery for under $30,000. So of course there's gonna be some cost cutting and you still get features like um, remote keyless entry. Keep the key in your pocket, push a button on the door, get in. You still have power door locks, still have power mirrors, still have power windows all for that 27 and some change entry price now. And you have a really good ride, Tommy, and you have really quick acceleration. Yeah, so right around 200 horsepower, and it really scoots along very, very well. It'll squeal the front tires from a stop. Um, I wish you could get all-wheel drive, that would be really cool, but it's got a lot of lot of push even at higher speed. It dies around, off right around 65, 70, it slows down. But especially in the city, it zooms. I think they say zero to 60 in under seven seconds is what uh, GM claims on this car. And that's, that's either here at a mile above sea level or not, which is great because electric cars aren't affected by altitude. You also get really, really, really good regen. So as you talked about that one pedal mode, when that's engaged, and you can see it here on the, on the dash, they give you a lot of information on the dash about the power and the regen. Um, I can pull up to 70 kW on the regen and the car slows down really quickly and I love this little paddle so this is cool so I almost never use the friction brakes on this car because I keep it in one pedal mode and then when I'm coming up to the stop sign for example I'll try to play a little game with myself where I try to time the decelerate with stopping at the stop sign and then if I wait a little bit too long so let's start deceleling now I'm not gonna make the stop sign I pull this little paddle and it'll actually slow me down quicker and then I'll never actually need to hit the friction brakes look at that just about nailed that stop sign. Yeah, you kind of blew through it, dude. No, I didn't. <laughs> but look, it doesn't creep either, so you don't get the creep at the stop, which is nice. Yeah, I think the, the, the best thing about this car, yeah, there you go, you just <laughs> scared the neighbors. Uh, the great thing about this car is that it's kind of a hidden gem, right? People, people because of what happened, so let's just talk about the history. I think when the first version of this car came out, you know, I went on the launch of it, uh, and uh, it was kind of an ugly duckling, it was, I was expecting it to be more futuristic. It ended up being just a little bit too kind of uh, economy car. You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the battery started to catch fire, and GM said you couldn't park them inside. Uh, well, then, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of right. batteries. I mean, it was so tiny and so blown out of proportion. Uh, but, of course, they, they did the full recall. The cars got the new batteries. But, but I think but that, set the, that set the tone, unfortunately. But what made the second gen so special is they dropped the price by like $9,000. Yeah, more like six, but go ahead. Well, you were looking at a mid $30,000 car, and then all of a sudden you had a mid $20,000 car, and then people kind of went and looked past some of the lack of the futuristic, and they just saw an incredible value which is what this car is. Now, when you talk about range, EPA rated at 259. I think that's pretty accurate, especially on warmer days. I can get very close to 259 miles. On colder days, especially the really cold winter days, it's going to be closer to 190 or 200. So, so the car that we had uh, for a long time that we kind of sold in exchange for this, right? We keep cars for a year or two uh, is the Mini SE. And I love that car. I mean, it was fun to drive it was quick it was more engaging than this but the biggest downside to that car was that it only had 114 miles of range right which makes it almost solely a city car whereas this you can actually you know use on a daily basis and not get range anxiety yeah 250 um and we've brought it down to, to basically zero one annoying thing too is when you get below 10 miles of range so the range computer gives you three different numbers it gives you the minimum range estimate the maximum range estimate and then the current range estimate and that's really handy because i know if i'm going quickly it's going to be closer to the minimum if i'm being really efficient it'll be close to maximum but then once you get to like 10 miles of range it just says low so you're doing really well, great, great precise numbers, and then it just goes low, and that's kind of a, a little bit of an annoying thing. All of that problem would be completely acceptable if it had the state of charge in the cluster, which I wish. All right, so let's talk about the Achilles heel, Tommy. Well, yeah, so the charging is gonna be the big problem with the Chevrolet Bolt. Now, I say that we do 99.9% .9 of charging on this car at home on a level two charger. It takes a few hours to get from, I plug it in at like 30%, and then I fill it up to 90%. Um, it takes a few hours to do that, and it does it, you know, while I'm at home doing work or sleeping, and it's no problem. I never think about it. 
Um, I have had to DC fast charge this car eight or nine times because of longer trips. And that really is going to be the, the, the biggest downfall to the Bolt is it's got a peak rate of 50, 55 kilowatts. Which you never hit. Yeah, never, the highest never I've, I've seen like 53, but the, the bigger issue than the peak is, I mean, first of all, the peak's not great when an Ionic 5 will do 270 or something, 250. So basically that means an Ionic 5, for all of you guys who aren't literate and gals in electric numbers, which I wasn't for a long time, it's five, it charges five times quicker. But the biggest issue is how long can it sustain those numbers? So for example, the Mini Cooper SE we had, it would also charge at 50, but it would hold that 50 well deep into the, the state of charge of the battery pack. This car, by the time you hit 60% state of charge, you're going to be pulling like 34 kilowatts. And then it's just so frustrating because it's already slow to begin with, and then it just gets slower and slower and slower. Now, I think Chevrolet says 100 miles of added range in 30 minutes is their, their quote. I've never really seen that number. It's going to be closer to 35, 40 minutes for 100 miles of range. So if you don't have charging at home, and you need to rely on public infrastructure, this is not the car for you. Yeah, and it's also not the car for you if you want to go like road tripping. Yeah, if you have to consistently drive more than that 250 miles of range, this is not the car for you. But I think for 95% of people that uh, are just looking for a car to commute in, do chores in around town, the, the, the price on this car and the amount of safety technology in terms of airbags, functionality in terms of technology and range you get for the mid-20s is off the charts makes it my favorite new EV because of all the value here. You know, it's it's so common to talk about EVs like the Lucid that are gonna be 150, 160 grand, right? Or even Teslas, which are gonna be 40, 50, 60 grand. But to talk about a car that's $28,000. No, dollars going, there's a trailhead we can pull into. That'll, that'll do all of these things. That's what makes this car so cool. Yeah, yeah, so if you don't have to road trip it, and actually Tom, uh, Andre and I, when we were road tripping the lightning up to Alaska we ran into a, a couple that was road tripping uh, a boat oh wow uh, and I think the dude was like on his third slurpee <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's also frustrating if you're the one waiting for a charger uh, because um, obviously the bolt's going to be there for a while charging because it only does it at such a slow rate it's a head scratcher why GM didn't make it at least 100 kilowatt uh, yeah but it is what it is I mean you want the cheapest EV you're going to have to I guess make some sacrifices. So l let me ask you this, Tommy. You, uh -huh. You've had this. You've been the one driving this car for five thousand miles now. Has it been what you expected? What has surprised you the most about it? Yeah, I think it's been way better than I ever expected. What surprised me the most is, um, even though this is a base model, and when you hear the word base model, you think, oh, there's going to be all these features that you miss that you're you're, you're going to regret not buying. Yep. There's not a single feature of the top trim that I really miss a lot. I mean, heated seats would be nice when it gets really cold so I don't have to run the heater. But this car does absolutely everything I would need it to. It's got Apple CarPlay. It's got keyless entry. My two favorite features. What else do I need? Yeah, and I, I don't think there's such a huge difference between the Bolt and the Bolt EUV. I think it's not actually that much bigger. Yeah, it sits a little taller, the yep. EUV. Yep. So if you want kind of that commanding driving position, but it's just been the greatest little car to live with. It's been my favorite of all our long-term cars. And it gets driven the most. We're averaging more than the national average of mileage in the past four months. Um, it get, I mean, it's driven every day. It's parked outside. You don't worry about it because it's an affordable EV. It's never broken. It's never had any issues. Not even a single glitch. Okay, one glitch. There's one part of my trip to the airport yeah. where I lose Apple CarPlay. Okay. It's just interference. But apart from that, it's been perfect. Um, it's just a lovely little car. Yeah, I would say this is the car out of all the cars that we've had in the last, let's go five years, that, have, that has surprised me by far, right? I was kind of, my expectations were set very low. The bar was set very low. And not only did it exceed the bar, it set the bar up here. Oh, one other huge issue. Yes. Trying to buy one. Yeah, that's a problem. I think people have figured out that they are affordable. But I, I, I see this kind of, you know, if I were to put this in... Historic terms, right? This is kind of the Model T of the electric car. Well, but let me clarify. The, the Volkswagen Beetle of the electric car. Um, yes, to some extent I agree, but I just wish that dealers would play ball with them. I wish that GM would build them quicker and that we wouldn't see markups because trying to find a $28,000 Bolt is still very difficult. And um, I, I wish you the luck out there because you should buy one and you should get the cheapest one you can find, but it's hard to do that. Yeah, or even if you get the first generation and the battery has been exchanged. It's a great car. It's a great car because now you're getting a fresh battery pack, you know, in a car that is affordable, very usable, and kind of the Swiss army knife of electric cars in terms of 
its bandwidth except for road tripping. Yep. Yeah, it's an amazing little guy as long as you don't have to take 500 miles trips all the time. Well, guys, let us know what you think in the comments section below. Um, definitely a buy it from us here at TFL. I'm going to give it a must buy it. All right. That's a new rating. You have that, you know, buy it, lease it, rent it, or forget it. I'm going to say this is a must buy it if you want to go electric and you want to do it on a budget. All right. We'll see you on the next video, guys. Ciao.